everybody. Thank you for coming to our new Austrian Economics monthly seminar. And I like, as usual, to remember that we started this adventure back in March with the lockdown when we sit down with the Austrian Economics Center and with Barbara and we said, our event in Rome, you and scheduled for June will be canceled, but we wanted to replace it. And so we started this long adventure with many, many seminars so far. And uh, we had almost one seminar every two weeks. And now we went down to our monthly uh, session. And today we're going to face a very, 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 very complicated, uh, according to some of our uh, guests and some of our uh, friends who said, oh, this is very complicated. Today I got a message saying, oh, it's too complicated for me. And it is complicated for me uh, because we're going to talk about monetary, monetary policy and the title of our webinar today is what can monetary policy do for economic recovery and there is a big question mark and we are going to do so with probably the best speakers we can have today in, at least in the liberal or classical liberal uh, uh, family and we start with professor rico colombato and we have richard Rand, john karalambakis and apologize if i can't pronounce it you know i have some background of ancient Greek, but not modern Greek, so I, I misspell your, your family name. And then we have a friend of ours that has already been with us in the past, that is uh, Mikkel uh, Jager. So before starting, let me tell you that I love our webinars because they are short and they are just meant to provide some facts, some knowledge, some know-how to allow our friends and family to develop their own thoughts and not to nef definitely or necessarily agree with us but disagree and please make sure and i'm talking to the speakers today to disagree with each other because we need to create you know a debate and some confrontation in fact what we miss today is a real confrontation on facts and on knowledge and the purpose of our seminar is to foster this uh, knowledge and foster curiosity and foster critical thinking so please guys don't agree if you want to agree try to disagree anyway because that's the best we can deliver to our uh, to our uh, uh, viewers and to our uh, friends that are out there don't forget that some people are present right now some people are live on Facebook and some people will watch this video later uh, 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 this month or during the, the, the rest of the life since the video is going to be online for uh, forever so let, let's start when we talk about monetary policy we heard a lot and uh, we have Professor Colombato who is uh, of course uh, uh, Italian and Professor Colombato has a great experience is a professor of economics at the University of Turin where he teaches foundation of policy making international economics and growth and development and you can see his full bio on the Austrian Economic Center website or the competitor website as for the rest of the uh, bios I want to start from there professor because in the past years, we heard a lot about the European Central Bank, the role that the European Central Bank has played with the former uh, chair of the Central Bank that was an Italian, Mario Draghi, and the famous Bazooka. And most recently, with the pandemic, again, a great role of the European Central Bank. What is the monetary policy behind that? What is the impact of this economic policy, of this uh, uh, monetary policy? And is there any results already? or you see threats for our economy instead of positive results. The word is yours and we start with a five minutes round of talks. Right, I'll be very short. I'll give you a few words about what the ECB, the European Central Bank is supposed to do and what it did. Then maybe we can have further comments later on. Uh, let's come to the first topic. What is the ECB supposed to do? Basically, the, central, the European Central Bank has two targets, according to the treaties and to the various clarifying explanations that have been given, or rather interpretations that have been given later on. The first, and it is first because it is also the priority goal of the central bank, is price stability. Of course, price stability means uh, in English means zero inflation. Well, the European authorities, including the central bank, gave a different interpretation of stability. Stability means 2% inflation with symmetry. Symmetries means that on average, it should be 2%. For some periods, it could be a little bit above 2% and a little bit below 
This is the first target, the first mission, and it is the primary mission. The other roles, uh, according to the treaties, is promoting financial stability. That means banking supervision, uh, promoting, let's say, general economic policies by the formulated by the European Union, uh, sustainable growth, and here, here, they can also go into sustainable development and the quality of the environment. Now, this is the broad picture. Uh, it is crucial to emphasize the role of price stability, which is not price stability, as I said, because it's a 2% story. Now, if you have a 2% story and inflation is virtually zero, or something like between zero and 1% in the euro area, that justifies efforts on the part of, justifies, quote unquote, legitimizes, let's put it this way, or leave, make it, makes it legal for the European Central Bank to print as much money as it deems appropriate in order to obtain the 2% target. So nobody in theory could object to money printing, credit expansion, manipulating the interest rate, and all the say, dirty jobs the European Central Bank has been doing in the past 15 years, because they would reply, we are trying desperately to obtain the 2% inflation rate. So what have they done? They would ask, they would reply, hey, we have tried hard and we'll continue to try hard to obtain that target. Second, they were saying, in face of a crisis, we have a responsibility for financial stability. Our understanding of financial stability means bailing out ailing banks, especially if they're large banks, because they might trigger a systemic crisis. That is, one large bank going belly up could pull down other banks. So, the larger a bank is, and the deeper its problems, the more we have to intervene, and we have to help it in all possible ways. So by relaxing the rules, providing ways to finance it in, let's say, indirect way. Third issue that I would like to raise, and then we come back to that, Bear in mind that many banks are in trouble because they have the belly full of treasury bills and that is public debt, and that many countries have a very large public debt. I mean, Italy, of course, is one of the first examples, but other countries are not in good shape either. France is another troubled country. Um, now, what the European Central Bank has done is buying treasury bills uh, since they cannot do it directly, they did it in this, on the secondary market. That means buying it from people who have bought treasury bills. This has been also a way of financing ailing banks. So, to wrap it up and keep within the five minutes it gave me, uh, nobody can say that the European Central Bank has formally uh, violated the rules, but the say, massive interventions in these years. By massive intervention, I ask you to look at what happened to the money supply since the end of 2017. During these part, say, two and a half years, M1, which is money supply, basically, has risen by over 27%, which is a huge amount of money. And so it is, let's say, latent inflation, so to speak. So they have printed a lot of money to bail out bad banks and to bail out bad governments. Now we can give our value judgments later on that this is what has happened. So everything is legal, but under the veil of price stability, we have engaged and embarked into a massive bailout program. I stop here for the moment. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, so you say legal, but we went probably far beyond. And let's see later on what is the impact of this, uh, you know, far beyond. 
Uh, let's see what has happened in the U.S. because in the past, you know, I'm an ignorant when it comes to monetary policy, so I'm very curious to learn. And I want to turn to the other side of the of the ocean, where definitely the Fed has taken sometimes anticipated what the ACB has done, but also has taken, if I think about the, the most recent months, uh, different paths. So. Uh, John Karolambaski is, uh, is the chief economist for the Black Summit Financial Group in the United States and teaches economics at the P Patterson School of Diplomacy International Commerce at the University on Kentucky. And he's right now, not in Greece, but in Kentucky. So, John, is the Fed following or anticipating what the European Central Bank has done or is totally on a different side? Oh, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be with you uh, this morning, morning for the U.S., of course. Uh, I'm certain that uh, the Fed and the ACB coordinate, at least to some extent. Um, however, if I may allow to follow up on uh, Professor Colombato's comments and make uh, seven specific comments, uh, so may I proceed with that that is related to what the Fed is doing and maybe also to what the ECB is doing. The first and I think the most important point is that we all need to understand and comprehend that we live in a fiat money system. And fiat money systems always collapse. So as economists, we know what will happen. What we don't know is when will happen. So we have built a monetary system that resembles a skyscraper. It has 50 stories, 50 floors. It was built to sustain five floors. We are at the penthouse. We say, what a nice view. My position is get out. The tower is coming down. I don't know when the tower is coming down, but I know for sure the tower is coming down. That's point number one. The system has no anchor. The system has abandoned its anchor since uh, Sunday, August 15, 1971. And every time we go through a crisis, if you look, for example, today's Financial Times, you, you will see that uh, one of the top articles is that the next financial crisis is coming because we have overextension of credit. And we all know that in the Austrian School of Thought, the overextension over of credit is the root of any financial or economic crisis. So the fact that we have a money system that is unsustainable and has no anchor is very problematic in my opinion. And the Fed cannot play Aristophanes clouds and keep lying about it. That's point number one. Point number two, yes, they have issued trillions in reserves. Some of those reserves have been printed, uh, especially since COVID-19. And when you print the reserves, eventually you create money supply. And when you create money supply, eventually inflation will come back and bite you. When will happen? Usually the lag is between 18 and 24 months. So should we see higher inflation by the end of 2021? I would say yes. How much? I don't know, maybe 3, 3.2%. So this kind of money printing, but it's mostly issuing reserves, because we do need to distinguish between monetary reserves and money supply, creates market dislocations. And create market dislocations, in some markets we see inflation, right? Inflation, in some other markets we see disinflation, in some other markets we see deflation. So this kind of dislocation eventually creates confusion in the market, and confusion for the financial markets whether that's equity markets, debt markets, hybrid markets, is always problematic. Besides that, we all know that the Fed, through this monetary policy and the ECB, has created asset price inflation. It's quite uh, incomprehensible for some stocks to be traded at uh, 200 price to earnings ratio. That's absurd. That's ridiculous. That was actually point number two and three. Point number four would be that we have too much debt. We have way too much debt, both in the U.S. and around the globe. And of course, of course, the debt of or the yeah the wall of worries uh, is China. China is nothing but uh, a big bubble. I call China the Great Wall of Debt. Um, China at some point will implode. 
and I hope it will. Um, but when China implodes because of too much debt, and especially through this shadow banking system that they have, the whole economy, the global economy will suffer. But US debt, Chinese debt, Japanese debt, European Union debt is unsustainable. And this un unsustainability of the debt will again create problems. So we may have a couple of years from now a perfect storm. I don't say that's coming right now. So if that was point number four, point number five is that we have stopped caring about productivity. And we all know, without productivity, nothing improves. So we, we are in a productivity recession. Soon we may have a productivity depression. And we need to, to start awakening from this productivity recession. Point number five and six and, um, sorry, six and seven to close. I think that the banks, especially European banks, have serious non-performing loan issues, um, especially some German banks and some also British and Dutch banks. Um, I don't know when the postman will ring the bell for the second time, but it will. Uh, and to, to close, I think the whole system, monetary system, needs a shock. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Luckily, I live at the fourth floor, so hopefully I'm not up in the, on the top of the skyscraper, but I'm not sure I'm in a safe position after your seven, uh, your seven points. Certainly, certainly all very interesting points, and I learned a lot, but I, I have to say, because this is more my, uh, my, my interest of studies, the, the point of productivity is so much true, and it's such a big challenge that we have. But let's remain on the other side of the ocean, namely in the United States. Richard, we got a shocking description and we are in 2020, so I'm not sure that this prediction are always so, <laughs> so helpful in this pandemic time. But do you agree with John? Do you think the Fed is exactly, you know, kind of creating this big bubble? China is in it, even in the worst, or you have a different opinion than John? Hopefully you have, because otherwise <laughs> we are really in big problems. Um, I'm going to disagree with you both on productivity, but on the monetary side, uh, both John and Enrico, they got it right. The, uh, it's interesting with our Fed, I, I'll just pick up from the uh, comments of our previous two speakers. Uh, last week, uh, Paul, the chairman of our Federal Reserve, said, the goal is not only to have 2% inflation, but maybe a bit more. Now, there's great doubt of whether or not the Fed can really engineer this. But the even bigger doubt is once they have it started, can they stop it? Because the monetary tools we used to have to stop inflations are pretty well disappeared. And uh, several of the former Fed governors are good friends and they're uh, sympathetic to our point of view. And their great fear is if inflation starts to accelerate, and when people see first 2% then 3% inflation, if they think there's gonna be more inflation, what happens? That accelerates the expectation and it can get totally out of hand. Um, I'm old enough to have lived through the uh, uh, 70s and early 80s when we had the great inflation. And I, I know the consequences there. Um, you have this, you know, all these odd things going on. Got a good friend who is a banker here in Virginia, and he is now providing uh, 30 year loans at 2.35%. Now, the Fed says they want to have inflation higher than that. Uh, we also have a deductibility in our tax code for interest payments. So, what this means is borrowers for homes are, have a negative rate of interest. Um, most of us already have pretty much close to that with the low interest rates we have. Um, you have the negative rates of interest in Europe. Clearly that's unsustainable. For those uh, in the audience who took basic finance, you might remember when you were setting interest rates, it was supposed to be uh, the rate of inflation 
plus the risk adjusted rate of return on investment, which was normally around two to 3%. And that was the standard interest rate, which had been around almost forever. Suddenly all of that is blown up. The outcome here is not going to be good. And uh, John was just absolutely right about the collapse. Just none of us know the date of the collapse. Um, in fact, I've set up a little company in Miami with a, a group of friends to actually do hard money um, tokenization of metals. Uh, but we, we have this crazy situation of where everybody knows it's unsustainable, but they're only making it worse. There was no monetary theory anymore. When most of us were in school, you had Austrian theory, you had Keynesian theory, you had Milton Friedman's monetarist theory. The Fed has no the the uh, theory, nor does the European Central Bank or the other central banks. Everything is made up by week by week. So we have this coming disaster. Uh, oh, I, I promised to uh, comment on, on productivity. It is my view, and I can't prove it, but I think there's been enormous gains in productivity. And uh, most of you probably have uh, an iPhone or the equivalent with you, the smartphone. Now think about all the apps in your smartphone. Um, years ago, when I used to travel to Europe, I would have taken an address book, I would take a camera, I would take all kinds of devices. Now with our smartphone, we eliminate all of this. And some economists have made estimates about the millions of dollars worth of value in a smartphone. You may pay $1,000 for it, but if you had to buy all those applications, even going back 15 years ago, it would have been a huge sum of money. Um, we look at how it reorders our life. What are we doing right now? We're having this global conference. Um, normally, Barbara would be flying us all in to a particular point on the globe. Uh, people would be traveling in. Um, suddenly, we're learning how to do that without all those travel costs. And uh, we, we looked at the total reordering of the economy. Uh, people who own office buildings they are going to be in deep trouble, particularly in big cities like New York, because people are learning how to work from home and do the um, all this kind of distance communication. The educational establishment's going to get hit next. That's going to go the way the high cost brokerage firms did. And uh, I think we've got these huge increases in productivity that we no longer measure in the old ways. Thank you, Richard. And of course, Richard Ryan is the economist and syndicate columnist and entrepreneur. Currently, he's the chairman of Improbable Success Production, the Institute for Global Economic Growth and Metal Convertibility in the United, uh, in the United States. Before ending the first round, let me come back to Europe and going to Michael or Mikkel uh, Jager. And of course, uh, Mikkel, you have a different role. You see everything from the point of view of taxpayers. So in a way, you are the one that is supposed to be to receive incentives and to receive the benefits of the monetary policy. As a Secretary General of the European Taxpayers Movement, what is your position? And do you see these benefits coming? Or are you so pessimistic like all the folks here? Uh, you're, you're, you're mute, Michael. Here you go. Sorry, I have to join the club of the of this group uh, because uh, you said uh, benefiting. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, we all are taxpayers. We have to find, finally we have to pay the bill. So the topic of the day: What can monetary policy contribute to economic recovery? And the question is for me, vice versa: What uh, what has the ECB policy not done um, for economic growth? Because normally um, um, we are very critical to the ECB policy now and the, and, the, and the approach of the European Union, what is going on now. Because supporting general economic policies is not normally, uh, it's, it's, it's on the secondary task of the ECB. Normally stability of the Europe, Euro and vice versa stability should be the main task. So the question is, first of all, uh, who is the target group who is benefiting of the monetary policy? And uh, 
mostly uh, the states, so to Germany, Italy, but the countries, and not not the taxpayers, not the small and medium entrepreneurs. And so we have an in increasing and uh, new debts. And what is currently happening goes beyond any measurable framework. Uh, look what is was decided now. Uh, the, uh, the the council we have, will have the European uh, debts. We will have European uh, uh, taxes. So own resources, so-called own resources. We have to ask. It's not own resources. It's it's an increasing tax pressure to taxpayers, to to small and medium entrepreneurs, to people. So uh, it's it's really a, a, a not to be explained situation by theory. So look. The Euro countries, but also the non-EU countries, even can refinance themselves using Euro uh, uh, tools. So, at no cost, you can get bonds unlimited, and and no foreseeable repayment. Normally, if you get a credit and you go to your home bank, you have to tell when you want to pay the money back. So we have uh, we print money. Normally, we should have inflation, higher interest rates, and uh, the opposite policy of the European uh, Central Bank. But uh, you can back against me, and I'm sure that the interest rates will will have to low, uh, keep on a low level, at least midterm, because otherwise, uh, all the countries, even Germany, will have a, will have, will get bankruptcy because exorbitant high debts, existing debts, and now under the pressure uh, of the Corona. Uh, pandemic, we have the creation of new debts. And um, it, I, I want to quote Winston Churchill never waste a good crisis. So, Corona is now misused by the politicians. And just to give an example for Germany, we have now normals with balanced budgets. You're not allowed to have an increase of debts. Based to Corona, we have 20, 220 uh, billion new debts only in 2020. On the, for Germany, Bavaria, 20 billion new debts. It's a, it's a new approach, and we have increasing debt next year around 100 billion in, in Germany. So um, it's a huge problem. And what, what makes me really angry, if I want, to, I want to come back to this important topic too, the countries have two choices. So support payments, direct payments, or credits. And there was uh, an inquiry from the libertarians in the German Bundestag, um, how, ma how many of these euro loans, credits were, were asked for? One, no single euro. Each country wants direct payments, for sure. It's better than to pay a credit back, but there is really a question what should be done, because uh, I think what will happen now with our market economy, if in the long run, we will have debts, and the debts and, and credits will not be repaid. Interest rates remain low, and the result, invested capital no longer generates income. So that's a big question. And, and, and also, if you look to COVID-19, so we had 18 before. What will hap happen with the next crisis, virus crisis? There is no money left, no space left, and our children have to pay the bill. <clears throat> There's a joke. If someone asks me, um, uh, yes, is, 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 is that touching you? Say no, because I don't have to pay it back. And even my children don't have to pay it back. Our grandchildren have to pay it back. So we destroy, we burn the future of our children. And it's, uh, the monetary policy of the European Central Bank is think, the worst uh, whatever. And we have to go back. And if you, if, and the ECB must be independent, have to be must put free itself from the political grip and no longer monetary policy that aims to support countries, but ones that fulfills the original task of the euro monetary policy, including interests and repayments. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks to me, I have a question for Michael. This Bye, is Richard, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Michael, here in the US, um, savers are no longer getting virtually any interest at all on their savings account. Yes. Then got 2% inflation. Savers are getting maybe one half of 1% if they're lucky. Uh, this is a huge shift of wealth yes. from um, the savers to people who are recipient uh, government transfer pay uh, payments and, of course, to the borrowers. 
And there hasn't been too much noise about this yet in the US, but I was wondering with your uh, affiliation with the various taxpayer groups around the world, uh, do you see any um, rebellion going on uh, about this for all these savers throughout the world who suddenly have had a huge non-legislated tax increase on them? And to the extent they are recognized this and the the extent that they're getting mad about it and doing something about it. What do you see? Uh, it's, it's, it's simple as the same situation in Germany. I, I think, uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, taxpayers are masochists. If they want to be punished, um, they do not realize what is going on. And then we have, a very, if, 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 you, if you want to, to, to destroy your, your, how to say, uh, your, your, your brain, listen to the speech, of van der Leyen last week and you can stream it it was in European Parliament and it's very simple we have to do something against the climate change we have to do something to assist corporates face to the corona pandemic you cannot we have to do a lot of things and so though the, you cannot say something uh, and plastics uh, we must do something to fight plastics pollution so it's very simple. Everybody says, yes, she's right. And um, the only way is to increase taxes and give us the money to the European Union. We know what to do. We will spend money. And it's a complete wrong approach. And I, I think it takes some time, but the small and medium class will realize if it's, there's a discussion, the rich should be taxed. In reality, we are the rich because the small and medium uh, entrepreneurs, small and medium class pay the bill. But people do not realize it yet. yet. And it's uh, really, you're completely right. We have a discussion, more transfer payments, uh, um, uh, basic salary to everyone, basic pension without to contribute to, to the society. It's, it's the wrong approach. That's why I- Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Mika. Thanks, Mika. And thanks, Richard, for the question. Uh, let me go back to Enrico and John at the yeah. same time. I start with Enrico and then going back to John. Richard some, said something interesting earlier. That's probably true. Is there still a monetary policy theory out there? Are you still teaching this at the university or are you seeing any potential new monetary theory? And following your previous talk, what would be then the right monetary policy for the years to come? Well, one million dollar question. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, a central bank basically is made of politicians. Uh, they believe they are independent technocrats sometimes. They're still following political leads and political incentives. So the basic purpose of a central banker today is to make sure you bail out what needs to be bailed out in order to avoid the crash. So uh, if you come to Europe, where, where is the threat coming from? The threat comes right now uh, from over-indebted um, governments. So your number one priority is bail governments out. You need money for to do that, you print money. End of the story. That is the monetary theory they have in mind. It's not particularly elegant, but it fits the facts. And I think, uh, you know, if you look at it from a public choice viewpoint, it certainly suits the private interest of the central banker and of the board of central bankers. So if you ask me what th monetary theory they're following, I would reply, wrong question. Um, the question. The true question is, what is their goal? And their goal right now is to avert the threat of a government collapse, which would involve, say, the collapse of the euro. And if you are a European central banker, you don't want to have the moral responsibility, so to speak, or maybe the historical responsibility to torpedo the euro. So you do what it takes to save the euro. You do what it takes to bail out and sustain bad debts. And you kick the can down the road so that the next governor will have better years, perhaps. So this is what Draghi did. This is what Madame Lagarde is doing. 
And with regard to the future, um, the new, I think we don't need a new monetary theory. What recent history has told us is that by creating some kind of terrorism and fear, you have stimulated the demand for money. Now, if the demand for money rises, you can print and increase the money supply without creating exceedingly deep disruptions. It is a, mar a market is in balance, so to speak, where you have either excess supply or excess demand. If you succeed in stimulating demand and people are accumulating liquidity, this is what happens. Uh, then if you know that people are drinking all the liquidity you're introducing to the market, you have almost a free hand to print money. And the market remains in balance. As John and um, Richard said, the big question is, when will the demand for liquidity come down? And in that case, you have the bubble bursting. And of course, I fully agree with them. If people perceive that inflation is on the rise, then being liquid becomes extremely expensive. Then you have a big rush out of liquid assets, and then you have a kind of self enforce self-enforcing inflationary mechanism because the more people fear inflation, they the more they reduce the demand for money and the greater the excess money supply you have on the market. And when you have excess money supply, you have more and more inflation. So we are dancing on the, on the edge of the, of the, of the rabbit, so to speak. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Enrico, very much for this uh, great in-depth analysis. John, do you agree that, with this? You don't think there is the need for a new monetary theory? And what, what should be the policy by the Fed? And I may ask, since you're also half Greek or entirely Greek, what is your position on the European Central Bank? <laughs> An um, independent Greek, not a <laughs> partisan Greek. <huh? laughs> What appears or what is circulated as the new monetary theory is uh, the very unfortunate, the tragic modern monetary theory, which is nothing but uh, money from a helicopter, which certainly does not advance productivity and uh, is not uh, theory at all. I believe that uh, the Fed as well as the ECB are guided by no philosophy and no concrete policy based on rules. And you cannot govern without rules. You cannot govern without philosophy. Unfortunately, both our monetary and physical policies are guided by no philosophies and by no rules. But in my book, rules should rule. I manage people's money. I, ma I manage cor corporate money. Whether that's 100,000, 500,000, or 500 million, I manage the money using rules. If you don't have rules how you invest the money, if you don't have rules how eventually you manage your monetary policy, the system collapses. And the truth is, we have no rules, either physical rules or monetary rules. We need to go back to the drawing board and eventually adapt the philosophy and rules. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, also for being very concise. Uh, Richard, do you agree with this? We need to go back to the rules. Well, it'd be nice to go back to rules. It's a bit like putting a toothpaste back in a tube, though. Um, I'm, a, I'm afraid we'll probably have to go through a great monetary uh, crisis or sort of, uh, collapse in some form or another. Um, I'm one who believes you need hard anchors out there. And I've all, I wrote a book uh, more than 20 years ago about digital money. And I'm a great fan of digital money, but only digital money, it, it is uh, tied to something real. I have trouble with uh, things like Bitcoin, which is just tied to an algorithm. Uh, it may be a bit better than the government fiat currencies, but it really doesn't solve the problem. 
uh, my view of what's going to happen here in the future is if when the, the government monies become increasingly discredited, when we go through this inflationary episode and then the central banks can't do much about it, people now in the age of the internet can quickly gravitate to various types of private monies. Again, the Bitcoins of the world, there's more than 2,000 experiments out there right now. And I've got a company that's got one of them where we basically tie it to aluminum and other uh, industrial metals. Uh, somebody's going to be proved not necessarily right, but better than others. And um, so I expect, you know, 15 years from now, the global monetary landscape will look very, very different than it does now. And once you have global private monies, as Hayek laid out in his book, Denationalization of Money, back in 1976, uh, the market will determine which money is best, or you may have multiple monies depending on the use. But I think these will be basically private units of account. Thanks, uh, Richard. We got a question by Richard, but a question uh, by another Richard that was in other audience, but he actually deleted that. Uh, Michael, coming back to you, and then we go for a very quick round to just close our conversation here since we got to the 45 minutes, uh, 45 minutes. Uh, Michael or Mika, what do we, what do we, what do consumers in Europe expect? And what is the policy that would put us in the condition to go back to productivity as John was aiming before? Very, very good question. It's like uh, a lottery uh, because I think the problem, the main problem we have is, uh, is that we lost trust in politics. So if, if you see, we were discussing what monetary policy do we need? Uh, we have a theory of monetary policy and uh, this theory is, is broken. Um, we, we, we have rules and politicians uh, violate these rules and then they invent new rules again broken so i think the first step is um if the if you if you get a credit you have to pay it back if it's any country if it's germany italy each country must know there are conditions if you want money from europe you have to pay it back that's the first thing second um, there must be conditions and then what is going on now it's a total mixture uh, with climate change uh, but, uh, uh, um, and, and uh, plastic, environment, unemployment, everything is in this package of the European Union. And that, that's wrong. You can, you must split it and you must control if, if, if you reach the aims. Otherwise, I think we have a huge problem and I think we need less bureaucracy as possible, less bureaucracy and not more. And, and I think money, and if, you have, if, you, if you don't stop it, um, with these low interest rates, the long run, we must return to a normal monetary policy. Because if you go to Germany, we have a bubble now in real estate. People go out because they do not trust. If I go to the bank now, I have to pay interest because I give money to the bank. If I would have said this to my professor in economics, that I, I have to pay if I give money to the bank and I have to pay less back if I take a credit, he would have said, Michael, drink less sleep and come back tomorrow. So it's a un, un, understandable policy now. And we have to return to a normal policy. We need higher interest rates in the long run and, and long term. And, and uh, better better use of, of capital. Otherwise, more transfer payment, more debts, and more liabilities. And I think that's not a very good uh, future. I'm fighting for market economy. We have to go back to the renaissance of values of market economy. That's my answer to it. Thank Thanks, uh, Thanks, Mikael. Uh, let's say, since we have very short time, but I just want to take, uh, after this pessimism, guys, you throw, you threw to me a lot of pessimism. And again, it's 2020, we are in the pandemic, and now we are have to stand in a financial crisis. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. Uh, let's go with Enrico, John, uh, Richard, and, and Mikael. In one minute each, a comment about what we could expect for the next years in order to go back to a, a, a fast recovery uh, with monetary policy, but also broaden your, your view. I know one minute is too short, but please let's try to do that one statement. Enrico. 
Uh, I mean, that's pessimistic in the short run, but I believe that people now understand that those debts will not be paid back, period. We're going the Japanese way, and the Japanese way is we have huge amounts of debt, it's not going to be paid, period, that's the end of the story. Uh, the big bet is on the role of governments. Uh, the only way to go back to normality, quote unquote, is to grow again. We cannot grow again when government takes away 45, 50, 60 percent of your income. The real story is not about public debt it is, or monetary policy. It is about downsizing government and taxation, and of course, government expenditure. If we don't address this issue, which is not on the table right now, actually people are looking and asking for more and more government intervention. If we don't realize that government expenditure and taxation must be cut by half, uh, we're, no, we're never getting back to, to reasonable and acceptable um, enough growth. Thanks, thanks, uh, Enrico, for this uh, meaningful hope for the future and expectation. John, do you agree downsizing the government? I'm sure you do. You already answered that. Um, <laughs> I used to say to my students to go back to Webster's Dictionary and see the definition of government. And they said, okay, what is it? I said, wasteful, incompetent, and corrupt. Whether we're talking about federal, state, or local government. Um, what would I like to see? I would like to see a, a rule where M1 or M2 is guided by 20% of hard assets. So at least 20% of the money that is being circulated to be backed by hard, real money, hard assets. What do I potentially see down the road that too much debt either goes away through inflation or through war? So I know that's even more pessimistic, but don't be surprised of a major war on planet Earth. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Really, you're making my day the worst way I'm, I'm happy to do, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also taking a plane tonight. So, uh, Richard. Well, <clears throat> Uh, we all agree we got the breakdown in rules, monetary rules, rules of governance. Um, a former uh, head of our Council of Economic Advisors, Herb Stein, had a great line, when something can't continue, it won't. And that's the situation we're in. Now the question is, when the collapse comes, is it a violent collapse, like the French Revolution? or is it a relatively benign collapse? I was in uh, Eastern Europe, spent a lot of time in the transition to Eastern Europe during the collapse there, and also with the, the Soviet collapse, watching the total collapse of the money supply and the whole existing order. In many ways, that was a fairly peaceful collapse. Um, it was a disaster for a lot of people on the ground, but it wasn't violent, and people quickly adapt, adapted to the market economy and uh, relatively decent monetary rules, and we see the great prosperity in parts of Eastern Europe now. And so I think a really open question is, are we going to be able to get through this and people will say, yes, this is a class mistake. We reinstitute rules on the size of government, the growth of government, and have new monetary rules. And I think for that, the jury is out. Thanks, uh, thanks Richard. Uh, Mikael, should I ask you if you want to downsize the government? Yes, it's no, no question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a question of the society. We have to discuss which uh, public services do we want. It's a public discussion. And if we don't agree, what is our vision for Europe? What should be done on a European level? It's a subsidiarity, a, a back to the roots. Subsidiarity principle. First, you're responsible, your own in economic theory. Then if you not succeed, you can ask your city, your village, uh, your state, your government to assist you and not any problem, please, big brother, assist me. It's a loss of freedom. I'm in favor of freedom, uh, economic growth and market economy. And I think if we don't do anything, if we do not start 
with our lives to fight for economic freedom, we will go, go through a valley of tears. I am convinced that later we will we, we have a renaissance because people will realize someone has to pay the bill and it's, it's, it's a middle class and then they will turn around. And I'm convinced that we will succeed to break out of this chain one single country. We have anonymity decision on a European level and if we succeed to break out one single country, we can stop this development. And I'm, I'm fighting until the end, who knows me, and I'm really by heart fighting for the taxpayers. And uh, I think together we will be stronger and we have to fight. And I'm happy with you, with you allies and friends that we will not stop. We are the right people and we have to tell the others that they are wrong. Thank you very thanks. much. Thanks, thanks, Mikael, for this inspiring and motivating speech. Thanks to everybody, Enrico, John, Mikael, and Richard for taking the time to stay with us. We nearly got to the hour. And as Mikael said, we were here exactly for the debate to inspire, to create more, to, to foster more curiosity, more critical thinking, and to, to provide the tools. Maybe, John, in a few years, some people will go back and watch the video if YouTube is still there. And if we are, hopefully still there. And maybe what we said was the correct prediction. Hopefully not. I have to say, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. I don't want to be proved right. Uh, but if it, if it happens, our words, your words were here. So thank you very much. Thanks also to the followers here and to the followers on, on Facebook. Thanks to Richard that obviously agrees with the other Richard. There is a clear conflict of interest. Uh, Barbara for the last comment that is complimenting with all of, uh, uh, congratulating with all of us. So thank you everybody. This event is being recorded and it's going to be there. A few video clips will be shared online. And thank you again for following us and enjoy the rest of your evening. I will go and pick up my money from the bank tomorrow and try to spend them before anything bad happens. I will be a very Greek person, spending all my money and then asking the ECB for some extra cash. Thank you, guys. Uh -huh. Have a thank great you. evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye.